Welcome to Daily Watch Talks 146, and we're fresh, freshly back from Geneva. Yeah. Uh, and we would like to share our thoughts with you on what happened during Geneva Watch Days last week. Because stuff happened. Yeah, always stuff happens, but this is... <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come back to that. We're going to come back to that. Let's yeah, start yeah, yeah. with uh, our little uh, props that we uh, have that have actually nothing to do with Geneva Watch Days. No. <laughs> Although they were driving around with uh, moon swatches, right, in yeah. Geneva. Yeah, they were in that little Fiat 500. Yeah. Did you buy one? Yeah, I bought a few. They're nice. So that is the prop, is uh, uh, um, uh, the, the moon swatches. Um, Standing here. Yeah, but it, the fun thing is, you know, th this is a thousand euro uh, great box, handmade in Italy, that contains eight watches. Would I put my uh, <laughs> my Moon's watches into this one? Sure, why not? Because it keeps your watches there. Yeah. So you can take them out of the boxes. We take out a lot of space and put it in the attic, throw them out if you like, if you're not reselling them. Um, or you can just keep them like this, you know. It contains eight great watches, so you can just put everything in there. It just keeps your watches in one place. Same for the beautiful uh, motorbike. Yep. But That's let's go robot. back to uh, Geneva Watch Days. Uh, just to remind you, it's actually an event that, that has now happened for the third or third fourth time. time. Third, third time. Third time, yeah. It's quite decentralized. It was initiated by a few brands, including Breitling, uh, Bulgari, Ulis Nader. And MBNF, MBNF, Uhrwerk, yep. and Moser, yep. and now they, after three years, they already have quite a large following of brands hooking up. Yeah, and what they do, it's it's decentralized. So on various places in Geneva, usually hotels, the luxury hotels, they book a suite, and they invite us, people from the industry, to come by and to see some novelties. Yeah, and have some dinners. It's super informal. It's not a, a, a full full schedule from eight to eight. It's basically you're walking in and out, you you hang out with people, and you usually see what happens. Uh, and you have panel talks. That's a great tent. That is the official hotspot of uh, those few days. It's not a full week. It's some people arrived on the 29th, but the official opening was the 30th, and September 1st was closing nights. Yeah. Some stayed until the second, but we learned that many of our colleagues were there for very very few days as well as we. Uh, we were there with uh, Parmigiani, uh, a full day. It takes a while to go to Fleurier, but it was well worth the traveling. True, absolutely. Super impressive, but... We'll get back to that. We'll get back to the Parmigiani. Yeah. We're yeah. going to do a dedicated podcast uh, because we had a great interview with the CEO, the new CEO, Guido. Um, and uh, we're going to show some of the new pieces as well. Some of them were embargoed. We can't show them until October 1st, yeah. but we promise you they are great too. Okay, uh, the Geneva Watch Days. Uh, yes. Um, um, Trends, what, what I noticed with basically all the brands I talk to, usually, especially the high-end brands and Uhrwerk or, or, or Moser or any other, mm -hmm. they come up with a novelty and it's limited. They're saying this is a limited edition of 25 pieces, mm. 50 pieces. Mm. Now, this year, I heard almost every brand, uh, they're launching without limitation, but explaining how much they're going to produce in a year. Yeah. So instead of this is a, this is an edition of twenty five. No, we're going to do four pieces a month. Mm -hmm. We're going to do uh, 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 twenty five pieces or sixty pieces per year. Well, Greiber Force say with the new GMT, it's going to be sixty six pieces in total, twenty two pieces produced a year. Yeah. For three years. Yeah. That's how they explain it. But also because there's a bottleneck problem that's affecting everybody in the industry. That's, of course, the reason why they do it. Yeah. It is the supply chain that is, uh, yeah, how do you say it in uh, nice Dutch? Hands, little cases, and winding crowns. So it's not so much the movement. Well, I know that I was talking to Breitling uh, during the, the, the wheels and waves in Beritz some time ago. And I talked to one of the, the, the insiders from Breitling. And they say, you know, we're still short of 40,000 movements. Four zero. 40,000 movements short. That's quite a lot. That's quite a lot. Yeah, and they're going to move from, you know, with back when, when the, uh, the former owner was there, it was around 140,000 pieces a year. And now I think that Brightling is going to move up to 250,000 watches. Can is doing something right. 
So that is, yeah, so every brand has his own dynamics and his own uh, 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 troubles in that. I yeah. learned from Topic that they're short of cases. Yeah, so exactly. So it's not so much the movements, it's the cases, mm. and they have a huge backlog, of course, on the, on the Antarctic. So, but the supply chain is basically a narrative that you hear throughout all the suites with all the brands. Mm. They somehow have the challenge. Yeah. What impressed you, boss man? What impressed me, uh, uh, um, I really love the, the Moser Streamliner uh, Venta Black Tourbillon in, uh, in full gold case. Yeah, that's a heavy piece. It's a heavy piece. I was asking them, is this, uh, uh, would you wear it yourself uh, throughout Geneva? And yeah. we had a long discussion about what are the safe places in Geneva and what aren't. Yeah, yeah. But it's a watch that is pretty much in your face. Um, but as an as an object, for me, it illustrates the, the the potential and the beauty of the streamliner yeah. as a model. Absolutely, I love it. I tried that on uh, as well as I tried on the the first uh, flyback version of the streamliner. Yeah, and again, it just reminded me of how cool that piece is. Um, you know, back then, you know, when it was introduced, I think it was around 2020. People said, "Oh, here's another Genta ripoff." No. It's definitely not a Genta ripoff. There's no, nothing it's Genta. Nothing to do with it. Nothing. No. I see a Bill 1911. I see Porsche Design. I see a, a lot of other brands within that great watch. Yeah. But what I what I see now is clever move from the Melon family yeah. to uh, come up with a with a different sports watch compared to the Pioneer. See, they make great and solid watches. They I, do. I dropped one. You dropped one. Um, I was uh, I was uh, sitting with Ed Melan in the suite, and you have these little balconies, and dear friend Christian was doing his job, making beautiful pictures, getting the right glimpse of the sun. Well, you tell me what happened. I was taking off the wrist, uh, taking the watch off the, the wrist, and that little slip that goes into the rope strap was a bit too tiny, so it just it came off my my wrist like that. And in between the beautiful suite uh, there's, and the balcony, there's a metal uh, foot, something, door, step. And it came right down on that one and it was quite loud. And the blood just disappeared from my whole body. And I came to Ed, I said, I, I, Ed, I'm out of words, I'm so sorry. He looks at it, he goes like, not a scratch, not a scratch, Christian. Looked around, not a scratch, we make solid watches. But still, you know, I, I was so embarrassed. You I was so embarrassed. This is a hundred thousand uh, uh, Swiss franc uh, euro watch, and I drop it. I feel like such an amateur. I I, I feel like I didn't belong there. I, you know, I I should not do that. And then I talked about what I just did and that stupid accident. And my colleagues were like, "Oh, I did that with Lange once." <laughs> and you know, another one was like, "Oh, I was with Rolex and I dropped this the day date on the floor." And everybody was like, <gasps> "But then again, you know, modern watches still solid." It happens take, to all of us. But Christian, takes was a ticking and keeps on ticking. Was that before or after you accidentally took the HYT oh. from their suite to well, another suite? <laughs> I uh, we visited our good friend, very talented friend David. He's the new CEO of uh, and creative director of HYT, and we know him. He was with uh, he was with Panerai. You know, he was with Mont Blanc. He was with Tudor. He's uh, responsible to, to introduce the Heritage line of Tudor in 2010. Yeah. He's a great guy, but this is completely different. We were hanging around with Tudor and, and Rolex people at, in the tent, and it was so funny that seeing Davide with Tudor, he was a completely different guy compared to what he's doing with HYT now. Sure, he's HYT free. is like flying around space, traveling in space. You know, he's wearing a hoodie, you know, he's coming up with a cap with fluorescent uh, writing, and he comes up with this, you know, the asteroid, and it, great and the moon runner, yeah, moon runner, and and the new uh, bronze coated. Yeah, the watches of HYT are that is a, a space journey, a space odyssey, if you like. And if you ask me if they're comfortable to wear, I will prove they are, because I actually left the suite with the wristwatch on my wrist. I think it was the asteroid actually. That I left, so I was talking it to. It was the blue one, yeah. The yeah. Blue asteroid. So, yeah. so I went to the to the suite next door, and I was talking to the great people at Philips Auctions, having a great look at the George Daniels uh, three amazing pieces. It's going to be auctioned later on. And <laughs> I was like, "Oh, hang on, 
I still got the Hasteroid on my wrist, so I had to go back. But to what, the suite. what happened to your Rolex? Was that in the HYT suite, actually? No, again? that was in my. my oh, of course, of course, of course, of course. You were prepared. Never yeah. leave you lower. Yeah. But what happened at Doxa? We went to Doxa because they came out with that beautiful Sub 300 Army, which is a great piece with a steel bezel as well as a bronze bezel. Comes with a black rubber strap or an army green rubber strap. I think that was an eye opener for you. Absolutely. Of and course, I was aware of Doxa sure. uh, uh, and especially also of some of the vintage pieces. I always appreciated the looks, <laughs> but I never dove into it really. And now I really, it was on the Thursday morning, it mm. was quiet, so I could, was allowed to spend some time there, actually mm. sit and go through everything they had. And it was eye opener. Yeah. I think in terms of the price, the positioning, the looks, the, 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 um, the army for me was really, uh, yeah, the masterpiece. It was not only the novelty, fantastic. but it was also fantastic with the beautiful outside uh, um, a bronze of the bezel, which it, yeah. it, it is an amazing, beautiful looking watch for, uh, for very decent money. Yeah, it was a 1960s rerun and we actually ran into a good guy called Peter. Uh, and he came in with, uh, with the limited uh, ceramic or is it full carbon? I Came think it was, the... we said carbon, but it was ceramic, I guess. Okay, we're yeah, not quite sure. We've got to no, look no. that up. Yeah. Sorry about that. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, he came in with that limited piece. Of course, it was a, it was around 150 pieces. It was gone like two shakes of a lamb's tail. Yeah. And it was good to see that watch. Uh, follow Peter to see the watch. He's called the Orange Hand, I believe. So he's very spe very much specialized uh, Orange Minute Hand. Is he Dutch? Is he Peter Sommer? No. I don't know. Because his, um, he likes orange. He could be Dutch. He could maybe, be Dutch. Maybe he's Swiss. But anyway, we had so many watches on the table at Doxa, and I went in and out of the balcony to shoot pictures, and all of a sudden I'm like, where's my Rolex? I was like, where on earth did I put it going through my pockets? And like, panicking a little bit. Mm -hmm. A little bit. A lot, actually. <laughs> it was because I put it on the side, so I couldn't see it. All the watches were on the side. So there weren't any dial colors or anything to look after. It was just like, Oh, there it is. Sorry about that. So, keep, okay. your, keep your watches close and, um, and your enemies closer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that, that was good. I, I really like the Doxa. I really love the Mosa. I think it's incredible cool what they're doing. Um, but also the HYT were quite fantastic. HYT were quite fantastic. Uh, of course, I spent uh, time with Tapek. Yeah. Tapek is going back to their initial reference, the Kai de Berge and they have upgraded the movement. Yeah. So the movement is created by Cronaut, and now it's more skeletonized, yeah. it's more open worked. They, they put on some, some adjustments and some improvements to make the movement more in line with the other movements they, they currently have of the, the, um, uh, the Vaucher movement that is inside the Antarctic. Yeah. And of course the, the chronograph, uh, uh, everything. It was beautiful. I think it comes in two variations now, uh, um, uh, a green one and a blue one, uh, and it ups the game for Tarpec. Tarpec is opening up again the order books for the Antarctic uh, expectedly in uh, Watches and Wonders next year, because like other brands, like also Moser and what I hear from the other smallers, they are really now investing in their capacity. Yeah, they're increasing. How many numbers, how many, we talked to Savia, of course, I didn't just talk to Savia, we were comparing scars, which is weird for you, of course, but. You fought the same war, yeah. He was he was looking at the watches, Savia and I, we were comparing scars. So anyway, he's gonna up the game now, and he's gonna, his annual production number will be. I think they're, 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 they're planning to go to between 2,500 and 3,000 in a few years time. And that is times amazing. Probably times four of what they do this yeah. year, yeah. which is already huge. It indicates the demand for uh, for for indies. For, for indies. Yeah. I also saw, for instance, um, for Uwerk, 150 pieces was holy for years. Yeah, we couldn't do. And now I hear Felix saying in the panel talk, "Well, we're doing 210 pieces this year." Yeah, of course it's it's peanuts, but for them it's 25, 30 percent more than they used to do. Um, I'm not sure of the actual number of MBNF, but I assume it's going up as well. I think Max will be open to whatever, a thousand pieces, two thousand pieces, if he was asked if he could do it. Sure. Absolutely. And I mean, the, Max is probably the most commercial of them all. Uh, yeah. MBNF, Max Boos and Fritz. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because he's a marketing man. He's a marketing man yeah. and he wants to, 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 to conquer the world, so he will definitely follow. I also, I also ask a lot of these people, okay, 
it's great that the market is going this way and I, I fully understand that, that you gear up and that you want to, to grow with the market. But what happens because the market will not grow indefinitely? No. And if true. you have your capacity for 3000 watches and the market goes down, you have to be prepared as well. But one of the first brands we saw were in the morning was Frida Constant. And it was quite quiet. And um, what I liked better at Frida Constant, uh, besides what we saw in the tent in the evening, what the watchmakers were wearing, prototypes, etc., yeah. was the Alpina Regulateur. Yeah. In a slightly yeah. smaller and slimmer case size, because I, it used to be 47 millimeters, a huge watch. Yeah. yeah. Uh, introduced uh, early on in the 2000s, and then it came out with a wonderful blue uh, dial with a matching rubber strap. You saw the prototype of the bracelet that actually yeah, with that watch. I wore it, yeah, yeah. That was really nice to see some cool stuff from Alpina that doesn't look like something other brands did. Also, what we learned from, uh, was it Caroline? Caroline, yeah. The smartwatch of Friede Constant is going to be phased out. Yeah. Simply because the competition of uh, Garmin and Apple is too big. That said, Frédéric Constant was a first mover when they came out with their smartwatch. They did well, and especially for Alpina, at some point, it was 60% of the production. Yeah, so yeah. it's a bold move what they did, mm -hmm. but it's also a bold move now to, to go back again. Mm. And I like it because Alpina is a watch with, with, uh, with a huge history, 105 years old this year, um, for affordable mechanical watches. Absolutely. So it, is, it makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this uh, actually th this regulator was fitted with the Celita, so it was yep. not a for the Constant manufactured movement. So that means they they can still keep keep the the price well below two thousand. So very timing. So we had so uh, we didn't go to Bulgari, uh, unfortunately. So we don't have any first hand. Or well, did you? No, 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 no. no. Well, that, I I got the press release, and it was good to see because they came up with this uh, Octofinissimo made by female Japanese architect, and it's. High polished, mirror polished. Yeah. And I saw my great colleagues trying to do pictures of this watch, but you see yourself in every angle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we were talking to, to Guido Parmigiani because he used to, to CEO uh, the, the watch department Bulgari, of yeah. Bulgari. Uh, so we were talking about how Octo Finissimo, they were doing um, art pieces, you know, they were yeah. introducing art into the Octo Finissimo. I like that approach a lot. The Japanese architect one, though, mm. little too flashy. Flash, flashy. Flash. Literally, a high mirror polish is a very difficult watch to look at yeah. and to take decent pictures of. Okay, and then um, what we missed, but what was a beautiful watch actually, is the Debetune uh, Perpetual Calendar oh, yeah, that yeah, they yeah, launched. I see that one. Uh, I briefly checked the Uhrwerk, and they have a limited edition of the Uhr 100 in uh, with with purple. Oh yeah, yeah, purple, yeah, yeah. the ultraviolet, ultraviolet, yeah. and a white uh, uh, strap. Uh, an eye catcher, as yeah. usual. Absolutely. And yeah, yeah. well, that, that was pretty much it. I mean, we we, we didn't go to the other uh, hangouts, uh, but we saw a lot of people in the in the tent, and it was good to see that a lot of brand representatives from brands not exhibiting in Geneva, but yeah. simply within the Geneva Canton, they were there yeah. to celebrate. And we went there. I was supposed to go to the Bulgari dinner, but I wanted to go to the GMT party because Brice who owns the GMT magazine. He is a hardworking guy. He needs all the support he can get, and he got it. It was a full tent with a great atmosphere and great people hanging around. And he also, at that same point, he introduced the launch of GMT India. Like last year. So, Kudos, Breeze. It yeah, was really good. And I nice. also want to do a shout out to Waco oh. for hosting a panel talks and especially for Every also day. selecting the right audiences. I, I was with one. I was with the uh, with the um, uh, the indie with the uh, Rexap with a uh, uh, Kari Futi line, uh, um, uh, uh, the Uhrwerk with Max. Uh, it it was it was great. It was the, the context was great and the topics were great. And I, I uh, unfortunately I missed the last one because we already played. Yeah, play with, with the young generation. So with our friend Ben and yeah. with uh, so that was uh, uh, really good and uh, really. Uh, Informative. Well, you know, it was Brian Gottberg and it was the young Pierre Barbin. Um, oh, sorry, Pierre Biva. Uh, it was the young Jacob and Co. It's the son of the owner. It was, and it uh, was Ben Kufer from uh, Norkane. Yeah, and of course, uh, uh, Frédéric Arnaud. Arnaud, oh, yeah. From, uh, from Louis Vuitton. They just came out actually, what is yesterday's the fifth? Two days ago, they came out with the 20th anniversary of the Tambour. Yeah. With the Zenith El Primero movement inside. Yeah. 
41.5 millimeters, good looking watch, kept in the colors of the usual LV monogram, brown and yellow. What else did we see? Oh yeah, kudos to Wei, you know, we met him in the Bourrivage. Yeah. I said, dude, are you alive? And he said, I'm so tired. He was working harder than anyone else doing his panel talks in the official tent. Wow. That was a good audience. Was a the good audience. The interest of watches is not declining. No. At all. It's good to see. Uh, we didn't meet any journalists. Not many. No. Not the first day. I met Jan. I met the, the, the Polish yep. friends. Well, I wasn't but, there. Uh, some Fratellos. But no, it was, uh, it was relatively quiet from the, from the press side. At mm. least that was my impression. But uh, the, the, the informal approach, the networking uh, is great. And I look forward next year to, uh, to be there again. Yeah, and I hope that Breitling will do the pop-up cafe again. That would yes. be really nice. Free drinks are always good. Free drinks, free beers and burgers, and just a light atmosphere. You can get an ice cream afterwards. It was really nice and refreshing. And not, you know, it, it, was, it was kind of a common thing. Yeah. And I think it was really nice with Breitling. They're doing this inclusive luxury instead of exclusive luxury. I know a lot of brands have been talking about this. I think Rolf Studer from uh, Always was one of the first to communicate inclusive luxury and not exclusive. Luxury. Yeah, it was Rolf, because the, the, the phrase sounds very familiar. Yeah, they Rolf made, they made it explicit. In it was Samad. Samad. Yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. So that was it, that was it. it. It was again, super pleasant, again, very, very busy uh, and well worth it. I can't wait to tell you all about the new Parmigiana Tonda PF collection, as well as what's coming on for that wonderful Fleurier brand. We'll be back with more. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening and uh, talk later. Bye.